All right, so it's always great to be in the studio. It's a Saturday morning. Dr. Dan Rose, how are you, my friend? What's going on? It is the new year. It is the new year. And it may be the last year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just saying. So we were talking about World War III. All Everybody's right. Everybody's talking so about we, uh, that. We could be, uh, uh, that's, could be the this big is, one. This is not the big one. Uh, it's not we're the gonna, big one. This is going to be the one leading up to the others that then go yeah, to the yeah. big one. That's okay. We had a good run, you know? The human yeah, race. It's been This fine. whole planet. <laughs> we had a good run. I think we did yeah. good things. I was thinking we were not... I, I was going to say I we could go we out on a high note, but actually, it. no, yeah, I don't think I, we're going to go I, out on a high actually, note. Actually, you know? I was thinking, too, that we, we, if we had a little more time, we could get some things together. I'll we could you, straighten some things as out. As soon as the, 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 the McRib was invented, we really should have just gone out then because I think it kind of peaked. Yeah, you know? that was uh, a lot of people said it at the time, The right? McRib, the Ozzy that Osbourne that, TV the Mc, show. The McRib, uh, it only comes back um, every so many years or something yeah, i don't yeah. know what that means but. it's a little like shingles that's what that is <laughs> goes away comes well back. <laughs> all right well at this end of the world talk is uh not helping my uh my disposition at this moment here so i want to i want to turn to the idea that it is the new year and it is the new decade so 2020. 2020, it's a great year. It's a great. You know, year. a uh, cousin of mine who indulges in, let's just say, um, Mother Nature, as the uh, as the hippies used to say. Okay, there you go. He's Is really he happy about it? the fact that there's going to be in no, it was January, April, right? April, April yeah. tw- will be a whole month of 420. And he is April of 420. How does that work? I don't January, know. February, March, April. So 420. It's four, and then the two. Votes. So, so you know. Okay. You know what 420 well, is? He should, he should put down the bong uh, <laughs> yeah, long enough to do the math on that. I'm not yeah, really fine. sure, but <laughs> I think that's in April on the 20th. But he's going to stretch it out. I can understand. Yeah, I can I understand he's, where, he's, where he's, your cousin is going. Yeah, he's right. my cousin, yeah. yeah. It's actually my mom. Who am I kidding? <laughs> yeah, tell the she, truth uh, about this. Yeah. All right, man. It's great to have you in the she studio. She was actually a to... member of Bachman Turner Overdrive. <laughs> oh, People no. don't realize that. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Bachman Turner. She was Overdrive. I'm, I'm she was her Overdrive. <laughs> I'm surprised you even knew that group, uh, <laughs> given the kind of things that we talk about. Well, here. Randy Bachman, he was also in the Guess Who, if you didn't know about that. Oh, I didn't know. That's where that, that Mother Nature, the new Mother Nature taken yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's Guess Who. Okay. All right. That's a nice connection right there. I, I appreciate that. See, my associations that. aren't completely free. They have. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, we need to talk about your free associations yes. at some point because yeah. I, I I got a feeling that, that there's too much freedom going on in there. That's my that's my yeah, thinking about it. It needs more too oppression. Much freedom. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, well, uh, you know, on the outside, what you have on the inside. We were talking about that a moment ago. So, all right, all right, man. So it is a good year. It started out well. Let's be positive. Let's look in uh, sort of positive psychology, if you will. I don't know if that's well. Here's what I thought we'd talk anymore, about because if we're going to start the new year, we should start the new year with a concept that people don't often think uh, a great deal about, but uh, is the notion of gratitude. 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 Yes. And not gratitude, because that's <laughs> I don't know the, what gratitude. Well, that was is, a Weezer but... album, but it's also just you know, I guess, <laughs> radical gratitude. Gratitude. All right, we're starting out with a lot of musical references, Sorry, but I'm, I'm uh, okay with that. As long as I'm we not, can uh, kind of find, I can never find those albums that you talk about. They're not. I will on, say I'm not a huge Weezer fan, sure. but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so, so this whole idea, of gratitude. Yeah, gratitude is a good thing, right? We you should know what? be thankful. Maybe figure out what we got. What um, What are we grateful for? I guess. Mm-hmm. Grateful is in connected to the uh, the mm. idea of gratitude. I'm uh, you know I'm I'm grateful for this goiter. It's uh, I don't know. No, oh, sounds <laughs> awful. She had more <laughs> iodine better, in my diet. As you've said before, better get that looked at. <laughs> it's interesting because you'll often see in medieval paintings they'll have a peasant with goiter. It's sort of somewhere etched into the painting, and that was often that was sort of a symbol. Yes. Of poverty, because as you realize, I think uh, iodine, and I think it's it maybe have added naturally. We add it to salt, or mm-hmm. maybe it's an actual part of salt. But yeah, uh, a peasant's diet would be such that they would uh, they might actually generate a goiter as a result of um, you know not uh, not being able to afford the uh, okay the See, nutrients. Th- and and this is an example of that reference from that free association we were talking about just mm-hmm. a moment. But it it's it's quite notable, and we should probably <laughs> take note of that. And uh, next time I look at one of those kind of paintings, I'm sure you, it'll you come will back see to some, me at this point. You'll see pictures of goiter. But, but <laughs> this you, gratitude, you know, 
it's going to be a, I, I, as you know, I tend to look at things through a psychoanalytic lens. Yes, you do. So uh, I can't help but but look into a lens. And, and there was a, take a second to talk about. Um, there's a theorist, the um, the uh, person who is credited with uh, inventing object relations therapy, Melanie Klein. Okay. And um, she makes gratitude a central portion. Uh, of uh, of her theory, particularly as it re- reta- uh, it, it, it can connect with mental health. Like right. for Freud, one of the ways to define mental health is the ability to be ambivalent. So you can hold like you know contradictory ideas, right? Different emotions in mind and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and that's you, that's tough for a lot of people, by the way. It is. I uh, well, actually, I'm ambivalent about everything. <laughs> so really, it's not, you know, that fits not, that fits very well. I, I, not, I was thinking of some of the uh, folks that we used to train in the counseling program coming to be to be counselors and that uh that that holding the different ideas they were really looking for a one source one route mm-hmm. to get to uh where they needed to go to help the person so and they were often, often a struggle and, you know and that often comes from one of the things that and melanie klein talked about this um because when we're in states of high affect when we're feeling afraid or we're feeling all sorts of things we tend to split okay and that is the opposite of ambivalence we are um uh, we are certain in ways that in the short run may be helpful, but in the long run, not so much. If okay. you're being chased by a bear, ambivalence would be a lousy thing to have. Right. You don't want to decide too long before you right. run yeah. or not in the case uh, right. of uh, or what you, whatever your plan might be. There's a lot of uh, probably bad advice about what to do if you if a bear comes you, your way. Really, so. running should be your first. <laughs> I would go with yes. running, but uh, As an and aside, staying clear. <laughs> I grew up in a small town in the foothills of the Tennessee mountains, and we would occasionally have bear come into town. Oh, yeah. And um, I don't know if you know how fast a black bear, as far as I know, no one's ever been killed by a black bear. They're, they're not, but um, certainly not in my hometown, but uh, they're, they're fast. In fact, there is no way you can outrun a bear. I don't know. I don't know. Oh. Maybe, maybe other bears are slower, but having seen how fast a black bear can move, I'm like, yeah, well, you know, you know, you know the old joke. I don't have to be the fast. I just need to be faster than you. <laughs> is, the old, is the old that joke. Might I apologize be the, uh, for bringing yeah. that up. But, uh. I will say black bears didn't, as a rule, also had wanted to nothing to do with you. If, if That's right. I think yeah. you'd have to really corner one and poke it with a stick, <laughs> and then it might get you. But outside of that, I, I don't. I know some people but yeah they might, they might do that but but um so uh and i'm trying really hard not to go on a tangent that about um uh b- b- which is, would be funny but i'm gonna i'm gonna avoid i know it. i know it been- i think we, we we've kind of hit as, as we do we don't go too far down that road because well time is uh of the essence, of the, so, the essence. So, so so there's this notion of ambivalence it's central to what one of freud's ways of just defining um uh, mental health well, for Melanie Klein, she added this notion of gratitude. And to be able to understand this, you got to sort of take a walk down uh, with her sort of mythology, her sort of okay. um, narrative of the uh, beginning and the origin and maintenance of the self. And for her, right. we, are, uh, we are born into this sort of splitting. And that, you know, she had this image that we are sort of, um, we have this oceanic oneness in the womb and then we find ourselves brought into a world where suddenly we are assailed by um, uh, inner tension and uh, the response to the world of this tension. So she often talks about, for instance, this notion of the good and the bad breast. And what that basically means is it, the infant comes out and it, uh, didn't have to worry about hunger and all these sorts of things so much or right. sleep. All this sort of stuff was sort of regulated to some degree. Suddenly it isn't. And so you depend on an external source, an object. Yeah. And the maternal sure. object is that. And right. there is the mom that arrives just in time, and there's the mom that waits too long, and so your hunger begins to grow inside your gut, and it feels like it's the end of the world. And that for her, the, the infant has to find some way to reconcile those, the good breast, the bad breast, the good mom and the bad mom, has to find a way to be able to bring these together. That takes us through that notion of ambivalence that Freud talked right. about. Mm-hmm. But she added a couple other things. Okay. Because... Central to her idea is this notion that we are uh, um, envy and rage are central components of all of our psyches. Oh, okay. For her, um, when when the breast does not arrive on time, we can begin to um, want to destroy the thing 
that is delaying our gratification or at that point we hallucinate that it's the bad mom that's actually causing the hunger that we have and so for her we all have a a seething undercurrent of envy and rage and it's always there and that um, we often find ourselves in fantasy with this notion of punishing the world for doing us wrong okay and that wow. And it, it is there at least consciously or unconsciously. And so for her, when we can move to a place of reconciliation All right. and say the mom is both good and bad, yep. and then we can forgive ourselves for the anger we had toward the mom that we now see is both good and bad, okay. then we have the possibility of reparation and we can be grateful for the thing that is in front of us mm -hmm. as opposed to envious of the thing we don't have or rageful at the thing that we think is attacking us. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, it, it, it's, it's um, almost an uh, anchor in a way of our personality development, the ability to incorporate these two different and disparate kinds of uh, notions and uh, develop a personality that can not just swing one way or the other, but, but maybe it well, with both of those well, things. And think about this notion of the anchor, anchor, because if you take the most mundane example, I think I've used this before, but yeah. you are, um, you know, you, you're, uh, your cat coughed up a hairball on your pants, and as a result, you're now four minutes late for work. Okay. You've got in the car and you're it driving. It sounds like from your real true experience here, so I, we'll go along. Uh, yeah. We'll keep going. I'm sorry. I got, I got, a, I got, a, got a couple of cats. <laughs> 47, actually, as a matter of fact. It's diagnostic. <laughs> yeah, it's there, you know. Right. Uh, but actually, as a, to, a, to fix this hairball thing, I just shaved them all. And I don't know if you realize this, but once you shave a cat, you also want to keep it covered in olive oil. So <laughs> my cats are shaved and they glisten with that olive oil. It's a... It's, uh, it, uh, it smells I'm, nice. I'm just hoping I don't get a meme that <laughs> looks like that because I, I do get cat memes from you occasionally. I do. I, just, do. I am. I, uh, it's one of those things. I'm a fan of cat memes. But so you're <laughs> on your way to work. Four minutes late. Yep. Somebody pulls out in front of you and they're really slow. Okay. And so for a moment, you may suddenly become incredibly angry at them. You could feel something rise in your chest and it is, it's fire. Ah, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you might also get angry. Why do I live in a world where these sorts of things happen? Right. God hates me. The world hates me. Yeah. Suddenly you're in this place, and this is the opposite of gratitude. Okay. It is a place of being overwhelmed, and you move to that paranoid, schizoid sort of splitting position. Mm -hmm. You're no longer mentalizing the first person in front of you. And so the goal would be, and we can sort of think about this sort of as we move into the new year, how do we stay in a place that is the opposite of what I just described? Because you could... For Klein, your ability to be able to say in that moment, wait a minute, what's going on here? I am late. It's not the end of the world. The person in front of me, who knows why they're moving slow, wait a minute. And this often happens since we live in a military town. Really? It's a, um, it's a tag with a purple heart on it, and they have a... Um, uh, and so you know it's a military veteran, and they're probably elderly, and so suddenly you feel really bad that you've right. been like, yeah, you know, uh, what, what kind of monster am I? cool your jets a little <laughs> yeah, bit there, like, uh, try to help out, maybe and it, figure it out. At that moment, you're able to move into a space that allows you to be able to see the world more completely, both yourself, the person in front of you, and the world. Yeah. You begin to see yourself, okay, it's not, I'm late, what's 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 the worst thing that's going to happen? The person in front of me may be moving slow for their very own reason. They're doing the best they can. You yeah. know what? Um, the world, there are people in the world right now have it a whole lot worse than I do, so maybe this, you know, I need to put this in perspective. That I almost need to, needs to be a switch <laughs> yeah. that, that um, people well, <laughs> go to really fast in some of these situations. It would be a lot less stress and anxiety and tension that they have to deal with. If they could kind of go to that space and say, wait, oh, this is interrupting me, but they're okay. Well, I remember me, I was talking with my it. wife. We just moved into our, our house, and we were in there, and it has a, this pool in the backyard. We're in the pool, and she was like, oh, we're in the pool. And she goes, oh, you know, we just, I hate this. We need to resurface this pool. This really bothers me. <laughs> and then I said to her, you know, these are some remarkable first world problems we have here. <laughs> she goes, you're right. That's yeah, we're floating in a pool <laughs> <I> really, <laughs> with the sun shining and everything, <laughs> like, flowers growing, everything. It <laughs> suddenly puts it in perspective. But in right. that moment, 
you could look at the surface of your pool, and the pool does right. need resurfacing. Yeah, there you right? go. So that, that's I mean, not yeah, that. That's a thing. She's not psychotic. Right. But in that moment, <laughs> there. Well, she married me. So yeah. They're, well, they're, there's <laughs> questions about that sure. choice. She has, no, <laughs> she has questionable. There are a number of things about her cognition that could be. <laughs> <laughs> placed into but more, more that, about you <laughs> than maybe her but uh we'll, we'll continue but at that moment she moved into a space where at least temporarily she was feeling the weight of the weight of right. existence was a little too much just like when the car pulls out from uh, out in front of you and then suddenly you're flooded with this and so you know for klein there's a narrative you have to be lost you have to move to a place of of uh, of inner turmoil you have to find the person across uh, across from you, and then the world itself, all in a state of uh, of of tension. Right. Uh, of um, and then there is a moment where there's the possibility of grasping it all as a whole, and then accepting it. Yes. Gratitude is saying, "Well, this may not be the best of all things, but it is this thing, and it's the best of what is in front of me now, and I accept it." There is this movement. This this narrative tension that one mm-hmm. gets to. And this is very different than, um, because one could take this too far, and I think that's what made Klein interest, interesting, because we we are never without envy. We are okay. never, uh, what's the famous Oscar Wilde quote? I've quoted it before. Uh, Every time one of your friends succeeds, a small part of you dies. Right. And it's so sad, <laughs> by the way, but yeah, I kind of understand it given the context. Of what well, you go on Facebook. That. And like uh, I, I, this is going goes back to my house, and yeah. you know I always like, I always wanted a house with a pool I could just sit by, you know. So I finally got that. I'm sitting there at my, own, <laughs> and it's a nice spring day, and I'm, yeah, everything. You know, I got yeah. some water, and I'm reading a book, and I'm out there, and I say, oh, you know, I haven't, uh, I need to, I need to check on this. I haven't checked my Facebook in a while. Let me check, and I open it up, and there's a friend of mine who's who's posting pictures of of him in Italy. Yes. And I'm like yes, suddenly. There you are. You know, I am now, you know, in um, in a war torn uh, country covered in blood and mud, as opposed to it's like it, it no longer <laughs> yeah, feels like a great place to be. I'm like, you were at the a pool a moment ago, and now this place <laughs> sucks. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> what did I, what, how did I find myself in this horrible life? You know, uh, yeah, I deserve better. Well, that envy is going to get you right there. Right, so that's what kicked in, I guess. And, and you know, for Klein, that that part of what makes uh, and the way she defines envy in a way is, or, or evil. Evil for her is a form of envy. Evil for her is wanting to destroy the good in someone else. Yes. So you sounds, know, it, not sounds good. That that's that's not good. And it could be, you know, and, and there are lots of reasons why people post photos on Facebook. I'll give my friend the benefit of the doubt. He was really happy he was in Italy. I'm really happy. And I'm and like, I'm going to hey, show up those other guys that, that uh, may don't have, been, have you know, it as, as great it as I do. It may have been right? his, 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 in, uh, his intent. But if we give him the benefit of the doubt, he was like, wow, you know, my family and I finally made it to this place. We're enjoying this. Right. Let me show you what how cool right. this is. It wasn't and, just to <laughs> kind of get at you or get back at you, man. And I could have said, you know, wow, I could have enjoyed the good in him. I could have said, look how happy he seems. Everybody in that picture seems happy. Wow. And then I might even be able to say, I might, after I, let me check to see how much flights to Italy are. And I might say, well, you know what? Maybe someday that might be something I want to do. Okay. But All envy right. would be to destroy him and i would do that in effigy i would know it wouldn't be the possibility of thinking about italy or thinking about the possibility of having the joy that he may be experiencing instead i would want to destroy it so in in some sense evil for klein is is envy unbound and it is a destroying of the good and in, and evil is a, a natural element of of non gratitude it is a place right. of, you know, um, evil. If you can think of the, the example of a guy who pulled out in front of you, you if you uh, you could do this in a sociopathic way, you take a picture of his, uh, of his uh, license plate, mm-hmm. and then you go visit his house at 2 in the morning and you slash his tires. Right. Right. That's, that would, uh, that would yeah. Be, yeah, yeah, you know. And, uh, but for, for Klein... That would be an an element of um, also key to this is her concept of projective identification. That part of what we do in destroying the good in others is we also take the parts of ourselves that we don't like and we put them in someone else and then we destroy it. 
Okay. And so we can literally destroy them in, in terms of, you know, slashing tires or shooting somebody. Or we can destroy them in effigy, in fantasy, and in the mental space as I'm seething there at, at my pool. Um, right. And so my moment is lost. My connection potential with my friend is lost. And the potential future that I might share uh, with in Italy or otherwise is also right. lost. Everything is sort of becomes right. a swirling, envious sort yeah. of, you know, boom. There it has goes. to be it has to be something that you can do about that and make that transition back to that moment mm-hmm. prior to mm-hmm. that Facebook posting, I guess. Well, for, for Klein, the only way through or the main way through is and post Kleinians like Wilfred Bion. I mentioned that guy before. Yeah, you know, Bion often thinks that um, you, when it comes to when we're, we're at, uh, in a, an affect state that's unstable, if we're feeling too much or too little, if it's. Uh, um, we're either either above or below that euthymic window. We have two possible choices, and that's uh, self-regulation and dietic regulation. Okay. And for Beyond, the further we are outside that euthymic window, up or down, the more we're going to need dietic regulation. It takes two people to think a dangerous thought, and dangerous thoughts usually exist outside those two points. And what that means is, so if, if I really begin a spiral of feeling horrible and shameful and whatever I might be feeling sitting at the pool, then I might need to talk to my wife. I might say, call up a friend and say, hey, man, what's going on? I'm just feeling kind of crappy. That's an example of dietic regulation. Okay. Uh, therapy does that. Oftentimes folks come to see us because they've been in this place in a chronic way, mm-hmm. and it's beginning to poison them. Right. They can't quite get out of it by themselves. Maybe they need a little bit more help. And for Klein... Even self-regulation is actually a form of dietic regulation because the way we self-soothe and navigate these or we pull for our internal object relations. There have been people in our life who've helped us to think the dangerous thoughts, and we pull for them. Mm -hmm. The people who've loved us into existence, consciously or unconsciously, become both the voices and the presence that we need to be able to move back into that euthymic window. Okay. And so... Either it requires another person or our capacity to self-soothe and bring yourself there. And that may right. require that could that could happen reflexively in some form. I might without even thinking call the friend, or I might even without thinking soothe myself. Mm-hmm. But for for some folks, it requires maybe a step in between, and that's some minimal self-consciousness or self-reflection to be able to say, wait a minute, what's going on right now? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to be able to then Name the different parts of yourself to be able to give a name to what you're experiencing that allows you then to move in either one of those self-regulatory or diet regulatory spaces. And the reason I think that's important, this is New Year's. Everybody's making yeah. these New Year's resolutions. Oh, if you yeah. made a resolution that you wanted to be able to accept the world with a bit more gratitude, not in a way that makes you a mindless cog in the machine or makes you a passive capitalist consumer because those are some positive yes. psychology. We've talked about that before. We talked about that There's before. There's the potential just, yeah. to be trapped in either one of those because what Klein is not saying, be positive. That's different than gratitude. Okay. Gratitude is is not, uh, you know, oh, this is amazing and great. Gratitude is, okay, there are good and bad in all this, but I will still accept it. I will still mm-hmm. begin mm-hmm. at this point. I will be grateful that I am standing here at this moment. That's very different than saying, you know, everything's great, everything's wonderful. What's what's that uh, that song on the Legos movie? Uh, everything, uh, what is it? I forget what it was. I but wish uh, I, I wish I could help you. Didn't see the Lego movie? <laughs> didn't see the Lego uh, movie. Very Freudian film, I by the think way. I, think I, I'm I think I fast-forwarded uh, through it and when it came on the TV, but uh, couldn't didn't quite capture my interest at that point. But uh, maybe something I should uh, go back and take a look at, maybe. So if we... We want to think about how is it without falling into some of the pitfalls that overpositivity may give us, but right. at the same time be able to stay present in the moment we are, particularly as the uh, the new year unfolds. Mm-hmm. So the question would be, how do you how do you focus on and and make it a, and practice a little like lifting weights, the capacity to be grateful and. One of the things mm-hmm. that Klein doesn't talk about this, but it is in the psychological literature, they often refer to it as the lived moment. And I think it comes from Donald Winnicott. And it's the idea that um, how often are we alive in the moments that are in front of us? Right. How much is this a lived moment? 
sure. and that this there may be practice there may be a way for us to be a little more active in being able to engage with ourselves and then the world in such a way that generates lived moments and right. that may be the thing to think about if go back to me sitting at the pool you know i'm looking at facebook and my friends in italy the oh, that bastard i keep going down so and so's you know wait a minute that there's they're all another friend of mine is Everybody. laying out by a pool <laughs> yeah there their pool's are. nicer than mine Here we go. You know, I everybody's start thinking, having more fun than you. You just, you know, <laughs> better life. And you'll notice, else. but you know, and I'm only picking up on the, um, the, uh, the bits of information, the selective data that will continue to confirm, right? The suckage. That's right. Yeah. Because if I, you know, I, I, I skip past the, you know, advertisement saying, "Will you support, you know, um, starving kids in Somalia?" I didn't suddenly <laughs> right. say, "Well, you know what." I, I'm not a starving kid in Somalia, so it can't be all bad. I mean, I I miss yeah, that. Yeah, you missed that. You could have you could have I mean, thrown sudden, that into the mix. My there pers- a bit, and, and I think that's part of it's when, almost the intensity of it, though, right? I mean, some of it just really clicks with well, but, maybe some previous experiences or your doubts about yourself or um, what what you're dealing with at work and at home and those right. kind of things. So you're already sudden, primed, right? right? And it even falls back into this, you know, the, the neuropsychology of it, the neurophysiology. You know, if you're being chased by a bear, everything is going to be a sign that the bear's coming after you. The rustle of leaves, you know. And, and if you're in this highly charged affective state where your uh, perception is highly selective, um, 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 that's not Mark Solmes. It's uh, Alan Shore. Alan Shore talks about when he ta- – he, he sort of – he says this is sort of a um, – um, a left hemispheric process, okay. and that in the left hemispheric process that we're very focused on um, abstracting data from our environment and creating a coherent linear narrative, which can be good in some situations, but over the long haul can be actually really bad. Mm-hmm. So if my narrative suddenly is, you know, um, I've been cheated out of the life I should have gotten, Right. Then suddenly every bit of information gets everything. <laughs> it's <laughs> that point. Right, and it's pulled into that narrative and then I'm just trapped in this loop, right? And when Shore talks about this, he he says that that's where there needs to be more of a bi-hemispheric process. We need to be able to pull from um some uh some of the right hemisphere and to be able to to um move from a an individual highly focused and narrow narrative to something larger. And mm-hmm. I think for, mm-hmm. for a lot of folks, that's what religion does, to be connected to something larger than you. Right. To be able to be collected to some narrative. That's why, uh, f- you know, it can feel really good um, helping people. It can feel very good caring for someone or whatever the case may be because it, it suddenly moves you out of a that focused, linear, sort of progressive place that you're in to one that's much more part of a larger whole. Right. And that often, I think, happens both in the lived moment and in a feeling of gratitude. If you can think about the moments that you're feeling really grateful to be alive, you feel a part of the human race. Sure. You feel, feel a part of the world. You feel a sense of not only... It's, it's, a, it's a, in some ways a, um, a contradiction. You feel a self-cohesion, but also a, um, a dissolution of the boundaries of the self and a connection to everything. Mm-hmm. And there's something about that moment, mm-hmm. you know, and, and and that's where, you know, Shore would particularly say that's bi-hemispheric in a way, that we, we are experiencing both those things at the same time. And I guess I guess right. go back to, you know, this is the New Year's. We think about how to be able to create moments like that in the year ahead. Right. You, you, you were joking me when we sat down, this idea of World War Three. Well, if you look at the news, <laughs> and my wife was, we were having dinner with some friends last yeah. night, and... She was talking about, yeah, you know, I've got this news feed. And the minute it came, came actually, where our friend was saying this, you know, as soon as it turned to 12 o'clock, I'm looking at the news and it's all these things. And it's like, you know, holy cow. It's like. <laughs> the world's going to end. Right. And that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, and if, and, and this is where criticisms of, of, of particularly positive psychology can be useful because Part of the role of negative affect and fear and anger and even envy in its way is it, it's supposed to give us important information on how to be able to act and do things we may need to do. And we right. certainly don't want to be complacent while the world, literally, if you're in Australia, literally burns around you. Right. You want to be able to take the feelings you have and do something good with them. But there's also a place where if you're not careful and you feel too much, you simply become overwhelmed. Right. And you can't act there either. You can lull yourself into this, you know, Disney-fied sort of overly positive 
head in the sand sort of approach to the world or you can be completely overwhelmed by terror and either of those keep you from being able to be a change agent in the world maybe a change agent and that the world desperately needs but. right and and uh, working on some issues for yourself in in some ways it does seem like there's a selfishness about this too and a balance with your focus on uh, being uh, sort of c- centralized focus on yourself versus others and outward uh, sort of direction with other people in the world in a greater sense. And so there's some combination of that. But it, it also seems like when you're in that moment you described in the by the pool that, man, that was really thinking about yourself in so many ways. It was really kind of self-focused, and you couldn't quite let go of that until something else happened. Mm-hmm. And what Klein's narrative, and in some ways it's it's a general cyclic narrative, you know, from Freud on, Freud was often, um, uh, he's criticized for a lot of things. One of the things he was criticized is that he was sort of a pessimist, you know, that right. that the best we can hope for is is the everyday sort of hell as opposed to the hell of mental suffering. And um, he sort of said that, I think, later in life when he was... He spent the last 12, 14 years of his life slowly dying of, of cancer of the jaw. So you right. probably didn't have the— Probably uh, not a lot of high points. <laughs> it there wasn't, some uh, yeah, sure. uh, you know, a great deal of pain. And I think he—even though he got a, had a reputation early on for supposedly being a cokehead, which there's a story there that—but he refused to take pain medication because it kept him from being able to write. Right. So he yeah, was, he, he was often in a great deal of pain. But— even if we, we, there is a pessimistic strain that runs through all cyclic thought, but the reason it's there is, and for Klein, you have to get lost before you can be found. The goal, again, is not to not suffer, but to suffer better. And even though my suffer was a wonderfully narcissistic suffering at sitting by the pool looking at Facebook, if I can suffer better, I can take that experience seriously, and I can do something with it. I can listen to it. And for Klein, I think, the only way to gratitude is through suffering. We have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death to get to where we need to go. And any attempt to shortcut that keeps us from being able to get to the place we need to go. And there are all sorts of counterfeit forms of gratitude. Folks who have, you know, (coughs) T-shirts and... um, uh, posters of uh, on the wall, and n- not that those things can't be useful. I'm, I don't want to, but s- a simple affirmation right. that doesn't allow you to move through that valley of the shadow of death may be a false gratitude, and it mm-hmm. may not be, it may not give you the lasting effects that um, that that sort of journey could afford. No, I I I, I, I can understand that. Well, it, it does seem like there should be some um, awareness, and we talked about this a lot, but the idea of mindfulness and just sort of being uh, aware, situationally aware, if you will, uh, in in any moment in, in your day-to-day activities and uh, mm-hmm. maybe just take a little inventory uh, quickly to see – uh, what the environment's like and how you're doing and uh, check in with yourself and see if there's some gratitude that could be used in those, those Well, we'll situations. think about that example because if, if somebody comes in for treatment, they come in for therapy, you know, you certainly want them to feel better. But if they sit down and they tell me, you know what, my, my, my mom, who was my only parent, and she's dying of terminal cancer, if within 30 seconds I said, well, you know what, that's, you know, that sounds tough and all, but let's think of all the things she's done for you. She's been alive for 80 years, so let's think about the positive things. Mm-hmm. Now, that actually might... <laughs> it, it, it sounds good, but there's something not well, quite right Well, it might, there. you know... Uh, it, 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 it's going on. It, a little too soon, maybe. Right, it might be. Cases, yeah. we, we, we've attempted to shortcut maybe the minimal amount of suffering required to get to a place right. of, 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 of some permanence or uh, of something. Right. So you don't begin, but I, I've actually supervised and seen there are styles of therapy that might actually condone that sort of thing. Yeah, let's uh, let's wrap that up and move on. Uh, kind yeah. of a notion uh, we all have pain. Let's move 
away from yours and talk about the past. Yeah, a little too soon, a little too quick, no relationship built, a lot of things going well, on. Well, I talk about this with, with, with my trainees and, and, uh, and, and folks that I supervise, that for me, I often have sort of a, I call it my 20-minute rule. And if somebody comes in and they sit down and they tell me they want to kill themselves, mm-hmm. for 20 minutes, I'll look at the clock, we're going to want to kill ourselves. Let's just stay in this space. Okay, makes sense. And then once we've we've been in this place a while, maybe we can begin to make sense of it and to be able to say, you know, it makes perfect sense to me that you'd want to die. Right now you were feeling hopeless. When you look back on your past, all you see is a train wreck and there's nothing you look forward to in the future either. You would be crazy not to want to die. This is a sign of your health. You see no way back and no way no way forward. Wow, that seems like a real moment in uh, therapy there that you want to get to to be able to talk about it and kind of slowly help the person move through that process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting way to put it. And uh, I think a lot of trainees sometimes are a little beginning th- therapists are a little scared of that moment and rather retreat themselves well, from it. And we often talk about then when we, you know, that um, – in that moment, when someone sits down and talks about that they are in such a place of surfing, suffering that that they are, uh, they're almost guaranteed their own self-destruction, the trainee or any therapist for a brief moment is going to feel a flood of responsibility. Right. The trainee especially is going to be feeling, uh-oh, I'm going to, now I'm in trouble if I don't handle this right. <laughs> right. And so for a moment, they lose their humanity because their, their patient is suddenly turned into the bear that's chasing them. Right. And just like the person who pulled out in front of me um, and I was on my way to work, or just like the friend on the phone, there's an impact and an impingement. And mm-hmm. in that moment, I get lost. If if they can allow themselves to be lost, and we say this in the psychology of things, that often our first interventions are almost always for ourselves in a session. Mm-hmm. And that gives them a chance to be able to reflect and interpret on their own space wait a minute right now it's hard for me to be really connected with this person as another human being right because i'm a human being and i can feel the pressure and the weight of a responsibility in this moment i am afraid and as a result i want them to stop it i want to either mm-hmm. kill the bear or run away and since i can't run away i need to do this right yeah and it would be there could be even a place of a moment of gratitude there because it could be that the, the, the new therapist could say how privileged and honored I should be that someone would make themselves so vulnerable as to say these things that are on their mind and in their heart. Right. They have opened themselves up to me in this moment, and it is a burden, true, but I am grateful that I have been chosen and I have decided to make this the place I am in the world right now. Mm-hmm. There could be a moment of gratitude, but it has to come. There has to be a, a journey of suffering to get to mm-hmm. that point. I think. Wow, yeah, this, it's almost um, uh, it, so important to get to those moments in the therapy process too, so that somebody trusts you. They'd be able to tell you those kinds one of, days, of things. One of these days it'll happen with me, you know? Um, I, I don't know. I, w- I would hope for you that it's probably happened before. <laughs> and uh, especially in training um, training others for psychotherapy and, and supervising, that's got to be one of those issues. You're trying to help people understand the importance of that and uh, of uh, kind of taking that Well, the, the first thing moment. they need to find, understand the importance of me. With any supervisor, the first thing they should really understand is – you know how important I am, right? And, well, you yeah, know, we, and, uh, we'll, we'll start there. That was that's not <laughs> a good place, and uh, we we need to be in this journey together. Uh, but yeah, so this uh, this idea of, of really taking the finding that moment, taking that that impact of it, uh, and uh, kind of working back toward gratitude. Yeah, it, it, maybe. It, it, and I like the way you put that. I wonder, is it a, is it a working back or towards? Yeah. And maybe what you said is 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 closer to the truth. Maybe gratitude is a place that we just lose sight of. It's it's a path that we can walk, and that sometimes we get off that path and we have to find our way back. And maybe that's a better way of thinking about it. It is, gratitude is um, um, a sense of. Uh, 
the attachment theorists call it, talk about it. Bowlby talks about it. This or maybe may, may not have been Bowlby, may have been Ainsworth. Uh, secure base. Yeah. That it is a sense of Bowlby, security yeah. and inner balance that we often need to lose, but we need to also develop the skills to refine. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like it. Secure base, huh? Okay. Which is nothing like first, second, or third base if you're on a date. <laughs> right. You know. Right. I know. That's a that's a topic for another <laughs> completely different episode uh, when we get to uh, to that. All right. Well, that's kind of a great idea. This idea of, of gratitude. I, I I wasn't really sure um, how it might be defined psychoanalytically, but the uh, the notion of uh, being grateful uh, in some ways for what you have and, uh, enjoying that moment. And and it seems to be that there's so many things that pull us away from that moment day to day. The guy that pulls out in front of you, the cat Mm -hmm. with the hairball, Mm -hmm. the bear chasing you even, I mean, all of those kinds of things. Uh, and And, then the day to day things that you have to do. But see, this also may be part of Klein's point. Those, those impingements are necessary because we have this notion that, that, um, uh, that if we could simply stay in this place of stasis, that we would always be happy. Right. But impingements are necessary. Hairballs, people pulling out in front of you, all this sort of stuff, they are necessary fuel for our movement forward into the future. We have to be lost before we can be found. So part of this notion of gratitude is we live in a world where, you know, um, wildfires happen. Mm-hmm. And that uh, there is suffering, and that it isn't that this suffering can be redeemed, or that somehow it can be justified, but its existence is one of the things that necessitates our movement forward. If we were always in this place of quote happiness, if we lived at Disney World, right? You know, you you visit Disney World at once a year, maybe. I know some people will visit two or three times a year. Yeah. And when you go there, it's a wonderful place. But if you found yourself living there 24-7, it might be its own form of, of hell. I don't know. Right, right. At least you'd have barbershop quartets. <laughs> um, and some rides to go on, too. So uh, could. That, that might, might be fun. But, yeah, being there all the time. So being which in that state Which they closed Mr. Everything. Toad's Wild Ride, which when I was a kid was my favorite ride. They closed it. I don't actually remember that one. but Wind yeah. in the Willows okay. base that was Mr. Toad and... Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, sorry you can't. They don't have the ride anymore. Um, yeah. Evidently, that's something that. You Which, have by to the way, through. if you uh, if you take uh, like I was a teenager when I did this, if you take enough peyote, that <laughs> ride was really wild. I'm just saying that. <laughs> that's <laughs> not. That's that not was. what happened. But um, yeah, just the, just the thrill of the ride, of being in that thing, whatever the coffee cup or whatever teacup is that one of those things spinning around there. No, no, no. I don't no, know no. what age you were, but uh, you're you're in a car. Okay. And so you, you're, right, you're out right. of control, and you're driving around, and you see all these sort of, you know, whimsical and okay. near near calamity and that sort of yeah. thing. And, you know, it's, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. There, there was a, a similar one. It was called Ron Jeremy's Wild Ride. No, but that is not. That, not, that uh, is not. That was not. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a small world, maybe. That's what you're thinking. Oh, no, Ron Jeremy. <laughs> no, sorry, Ron sorry, Jeremy. sorry. I hate to, I, I, <laughs> it's a I big really world hate to set all. these up and uh, <laughs> set them up, knock him down. That's uh, Henny Youngman for, for a really uh, far back reference right there in the in the past. All right, my friend. So uh, that's that's been uh, that's been really uh, really really helpful. How do so uh, is it the case that we might want to have? more of the we working toward more of the gratitude state if you will than um, all the other things that are kind of not so great for us uh, and that's something we should take into consideration maybe you know if we're gonna if we're gonna balance this out why can't it be you know 60 right. 40 maybe something like right. that i think there's a place for practice i think there's the capacity to be able to as you're looking at your news feed and you can see the horrendous things that are happening yeah, and some of those new f- fees. Let's just say, if you got a Twitter account, or if you got some of those things going, 
it's just entertainment more than it is something you should shape your life yeah. on. Uh, so be careful about how far you go down that road, I would say. Yeah, I don't, you, when you're reading an article about Ron Perlman's detached retina, I mean, that doesn't cause <laughs> anywhere near as much. Uh, oh. <laughs> so, oh, I mean, it's sounds, painful for, for Ron. It sounds and I painful, it, yeah. And I like the guy, and I hope he's, he's, but, he's uh, good. But <laughs> I think that there is the possibility as one is assailed by those news feeds that one feels a, um, a staggering disquiet. One feels, um, dare I say, a sense of hopelessness, sort of. There's a chance then. You are then in the valley of the shadow of death. At that moment, I think there's the capacity to be honest with what you feel. But then there's the possibility of continuing with those feelings to see if you can move to a place that allows you some perspective. Everything in the news feed is true. It's not the only truth that's there. There you go. Uh, it's also not the only truth in the future. And right. even if it were true, we were joking about World War III. Yep. Uh, everything has a time stamp on it. And if it were so true that, you know, be it by World War III or asteroid heading our way, yes. if it is inevitable, it is what it is, there's still the capacity to be able to say, at least I had a chance to show up. You know? Okay. I, uh, I, I was, was here. The, I was in the game. I, I got to play. I was in the game. Got, got, a, got at bat I, at some I, point, maybe. I got to play. <laughs> and, you know, not that that's enough or should be enough, but there is a place there that has at least a hint of gratitude, I think. Yeah. Well, let's work on it. What do you say? All right, my friend. Thank you for uh, helping us with that interpretation, and I like I like the idea of gratitude. I also like the I'm, idea if, if there's anybody out there listening to this that petitioned yes. Disney for that Mr. White to bring back Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. No. <laughs> I want that. Thing, All right, you know. you <laughs> I, I still have some peyote saved up. Yeah, from, uh, <laughs> that was unfortunate. Last time I was there uh, misled back in the days. So, uh, well, let's get that uh, that petition going. You can stand out in front of a public somewhere and get some signatures on that and uh, try to get that ride back. Don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. More like soon. standing outside gonna... Vape City, really. <laughs> Vape City. That's probably oh a place God. where I'm going to get Well, that's another thing. Maybe we need to do a show about that and what's happening in the world. But um, All right, my friend, I appreciate it. Talk to you next time.